what do you believe about this god? Uh, What's this god like? Mysterious. Uh, it, it involves uh, simply uh, faith uh, in, a, in, a, in a being that you can't describe, you can't feel, can't touch. You just have to be, uh, I just have to believe. You, you, you're kind of saying that it might not be a person. But yeah. you think that there's some kind of a force out there? That's what I'm, yeah, I don't think it's a person at all. You don't think it's a no. person at all? No. Okay. I think it's something that we can't even wrap our heads around at this point. And God is on heaven and watching us, watching us right now. And okay, so you believe that he is out there, he's yeah. watching us. You believe that God is, is a personal God then? Well, if somebody, if somebody died, you know, my boyfriend died and I feel I put a candle on and a candle doesn't go down, you know. The candle just stays on, stays on, you know. Okay. And uh, I think the God is out there. All right. So you think you know. the God is up there? Does God have a personality, or is God more of a force? Would you say? Or? Well, I don't think we, I don't think we're capable of understanding what God is. Okay. He's, but I don't think it's an old white guy with a beard. But it's possible. Anything is possible. Okay. Okay. Well, I believe God is um, a combination of all of the great prophets in the world, all of the messiahs. Okay. I think he is an energy field. He is a combination like the Holy Trinity. If, if there were a God, okay, mm -hmm. what, what would you believe this God should be like? Well, I'm a devout atheist, so I can't, <clears throat> I can't really answer that question. Okay. You know, how can I answer it? Smile for me, will you? This is going to be enjoyable, I promise. Those of you who have your handouts, I want you to flip over on the back. I chuckled when Manuel gave me the, the topic that he wanted me to discuss today. He said, what is God like? How do you do that? What is God like? And I'm sure all of us here have this idea, this picture of what we would say if we got that opportunity. It, well, the reason I chuckled is because every time the Good News Tour, and I want to thank the Good News Tour once again for inviting me and Renewed Heart Ministries to be a part of another uh, series of presentations. But every time I've been invited and assigned a topic, there has always been two or three presentations that I've given in the past that have popped into my head on that topic and said, oh, if I could just combine those three in a 40-minute section, that'll work. Well, this time he said, come speak about what God is like. And I thought about the last 10 years of sermons. And I thought, how am I going to put 500 sermons into 40 minutes? But really, no matter how much time we spend this morning on this topic... It's just not going to be adequate, is it? It's not going to be sufficient. You see, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own journey. I want to recommend for you, if you go to our website, renewedheartministries.com, there are three presentations I want you to take note of. The first one is entitled, write this down in your gray section on your notes there for your handout. The first one is entitled, Who Do You See? Some of you have heard my testimony with my earthly father and myself and how that affected my experience with my heavenly father. Um, I want to recommend to you another presentation called, He Already Had. He Already Had. And the third one is the title that you have on your handout this morning called The Awakening. Some of you already are aware of this. I grew up in West Virginia, and at about age seven, my folks were very enamored with a television preacher and his wife. Anyone here ever heard of Jim and Tammy Baker before? Anyone ever heard of those two? My family became, my parents became, my stepdad and my mother became so enamored with their ministry that they decided, let's sell everything we have and move to Charlotte, North Carolina and become a part of Jim and Tammy Baker's ministry. Let's become a part of PTL. And in doing so, my father became a cameraman for the show. My mother, some of you have heard parts of this. Anyone remember what my mother did for an occupation? She was a cosmetologist. <clears throat> my, 
but she did not do that, okay? You can't blame Tammy on my mom. That woman had her own makeup artist. Do you know what I mean by that? And I found myself, and that was my introduction to Christianity. When that all unraveled and fell apart, my mother was going through a brutal divorce. We moved from Charlotte, North Carolina, back up to West Virginia. And during this whole time, there's this longing, there's searching in my heart for a father's love and acceptance. We became involved in a very behaviorally oriented religion, a very behaviorally focused version of Christianity. And I remember thinking, man, if I don't keep the commandments, Someone had shared with me about the seven last plagues in the book of Revelation. I thought, man, if I don't keep the commandments, then I'm going to get those plagues, and they don't look comfortable. Can anyone identify with that kind of a motive of following, serving God? And you have to understand, those of you, once again, who have heard the testimony with me and my father, all I wanted as a young kid was the love and acceptance of my dad, of a dad. I didn't hear, I didn't get to hear the words, I'm proud of you, from my father till in my mid-twenties. But as a teenager, that's all I wanted was the love and acceptance of a father. I found myself gravitating towards trying to behave as strict and stringent as possible in order to earn the approval and acceptance and love of, of a heavenly father. Anyone ever been there before? I found myself wanting to surround myself with other people who were zealous about getting their behavior correct. Have you ever been in that place before? You just want to be around people that care about doing it right. And so I went to an academy that was very strict, very behaviorally oriented. And I remember, I cannot impress upon you how close I was to religious burnout as a teenager at that point. I couldn't figure out what was right or wrong about music, so I just didn't listen to anything. Someone told me that health is really important to God, so I tried to be really healthy. Let me tell you how whacked out that got. Someone told me that wearing a belt, and I'm wearing one, see? Wearing a belt is really bad for you. And I don't know where people get this stuff, but they said, you need to be wearing suspenders. <laughs> now I'm a 16-year-old kid. All I want is the love and acceptance of God, and I've got this, you know, whacked out picture of what he's like in my head. And I just want to earn so much his approval of me. I just want him to let me in. Do you know what that means? Stop holding me at bay and let me in. And I figured, man, if my pants are too heavy to be suspended from my waist, then my boxers are too. I'm not kidding. That's where I was. So I wore two pairs of suspenders every day. One underneath my shirt, suspending my boxers. And the next on the outside of my shirt, suspending my pants. Is that too much information? Yeah. <laughs> You'll get over it. I share all that to help you understand where I was at when the event that I'm going to describe to you this morning took place. This was my headspace. Do you get how messed up I was as a kid? I wasn't messed up on drugs. I wasn't messed up on, on sex and on rock and roll. I got messed up on religion. Do you know what that means? And it was bad. I got a phone call at 6 o'clock one morning. 
It was a friend of mine who lived in town, went to the same school. He said, I was living in a boy's dormitory. He said, Herb, you got to get up and come look at this. You got to come read this quote. You got to come look at this statement this Christian author had written. I said, man, how old's that book? They said, it's about 150 years old. I said, so that book's been around for 150 years. They said, yeah. I said, man, it is six o'clock in the morning. It's going to be here a few more hours. But nonetheless, I snuck out of the dorm. I thought, this is crazy. I'm going to get kicked out of academy for going to read something about God. So I got there, and I'll never forget. He opens the door. He sticks this book in my hand, and he gives me this statement. I read this statement. I'm not going to share the statement with you this morning. I'm going to share the concept with you. You see, in Genesis chapter 2, God had said to Adam and Eve, and whether you believe that story is true or whether it's figurative, whether it's literal or whether it's just a nice story to prove a point, I don't care this morning. My point is, even if it's just for a nice point, what is the point? In the day that you eat of it, God had said you will what? You would die. And this began to really dawn upon my understanding at that moment. God began to whisper something to me. Just a certain phrase. He said, and you will be like your father in heaven. So wait a second. I, I, I know that verse from somewhere. You have to understand, I, as a teenager in high school, I was failing my junior year of high school getting D's because I was memorizing 50 Bible verses a day instead of doing schoolwork. Do you catch that? And why was I doing that? What was my motive? Are you with me this morning? Do Canadians talk out loud? In the South, they're much more verbal. You've got to talk to me or I'll make you stand up again. We'll do religious calisthenics. Or is that the word? Yeah, okay. What was my motive for memorizing all those Bible verses every day? I want the love and acceptance of a heavenly father. That's all I want. I just want him to approve and accept me. And he kept saying this, and you will be like your father in heaven. You will be like your father in heaven. Where, where do I know that verse from? Where is that verse from? Does anyone here know? And you will be like your father in heaven. Anyone know? Do good to those that hate you. Bless those that curse you. Love your enemies. Do good, hoping for nothing back in return. He didn't say all that stuff to me. All he said to me in that morning was, and you will be like your father in heaven. Do you know what that made me ask? What is he like? What is he like then? And I began to search. I read this statement. I'm going to share with you the thought in this statement. In the day that Adam and Eve should have, when they, when they ate, what should have happened in that very day? What should have happened? Did they? No, because you're here right now. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you breathing? Breathe. See, you are alive this morning, I can tell. It's just Saturday, so you haven't had your coffee yet. <laughs> this was where my logic went that morning. I was trying so hard to try to get a God who would save me in the future. And whether you're someone who believes that when you die, you go to heaven, or, or you wait for the resurrection, then you go to heaven, or there's destruction when you die, or there's eternal torment, or there's destruction after the millennium, wherever you're at on the map of that, the point is all of us somehow are trying to motivate God to save us in some future application. Are you with me? At some point in the future, we want God to rescue us, to make the decision today that our eternal fate will not be this over here, but this over here at some point in the future. You got it? But in the day that you ate of it, you should have died. 
Do you catch what God was whispering to me that morning? I thought in that moment, well, if Adam and Eve sinned, and in that moment they were no longer entitled to a breath of air, a ray of sunshine, or a particle of food, if when they sinned, they should have died at that moment, I've sinned too. Where should I be right now? And God began to whisper, Herb, you have have been working so hard to try to motivate me to do something for you in the future that I have already been doing for you every moment of your life, not because you're good enough, but just because I love you. Now I was a teenager and the pendulum was about to swing. Do you know what that means? As bound up as I was over here with my two pairs of suspenders and my 50 Bible verses a day. It was about to swing. And I began to feel it breaking. I I was so, there was this deep-seated anger inside of me. Okay, God, well, if you're really this good, what does every teenager want to do? What does every teenager do? Anybody here ever been a teenager? (laughs) When they find out someone loves them, what do they do? Yes! They want to press on it a bit, see if it's genuine, don't they? And so I said, fine, God. So you've been saving me. It was, it was shocking to me how quickly it went from awe to anger. Fine, God, if you've been doing this all my life, and if you're really that good, and if you're really that loving, what happens if I'm going to choose to be your enemy? What if I choose to take this life you're giving me and I just use you? I use it for my own selfish pursuits and I use it not... What if I spend every day for the rest of my life cursing you and doing everything I can do to undo what you're doing on this planet? And you know what he kept whispering to me? And you will be like your father in heaven. Well, that's not an answer. And you will be like your father in heaven. And you will be like your father in heaven. Well, God, I don't know what that's like. What what I'm asking you is what if I choose to curse you, be your enemy, and use you? And all he's doing is whispering, and you will be like your father in heaven. I said, fine. I looked over at my friend. I said, do you have a Bible? Of course he did. So he gave it to me. I said, I got to find this verse. For some reason, this verse is in my head. It's Matthew 5. Turn there with me. We'll get to the handout. Take your Bibles if you have them. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to be reading from you, to you from the left in every hotel version. I don't know which one it is. I just grabbed it out of the dresser this morning. Verse 43, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, and I can't explain to you what this did for me in that moment as I read these words. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father in heaven because he causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Man, I sat there on the front row last night as Marco said these words. We don't serve God because of the way he treats the righteous. We serve God because of the way he treats the wicked. And man, I just wanted to get up and stand on that pew and shout that from the rooftops. Because that really is it, isn't it? Is there anyone here that sees it? Are you with me? I mean, I served so long because of how I thought he was going to treat me, what he was like towards, what he would be like towards me if I was good, if I was a good kid. And then when I realized that even if I was bad, even if I hated his guts, even if I chose to be his enemy, do you know what he would do to me? He would love me 
Yes, he loves his enemies. What if I choose to use him? He's going to intercede for me. What if I curse him? Oh, this one's hard. What, is, what does it say? What does he tell us to do to those who curse us? Bless them. God, if I spend every day of my life cursing you, are you really telling me that your response will be to bless me? Process that. Usually, we do all kinds of things trying to get God to what? Jesus died for the ungodly. Do you get that? Why do we try to be so godly to earn it then? He died for the ungodly. And I'm not saying we should bask in that, but man, we should realize it at least. Amen? Amen. And realize what it says about him. Luke, look at Luke 6, the same passage in Luke 6, because I had to go find it somewhere else. Look at Luke 6 with me, and then we'll get to our handout. Luke 6 is phenomenal, because every Bible I've ever looked in, I like looking at people's Bibles, especially the ones that are falling apart and that are underlined. Have you ever seen a Bible like that? Anybody got a Bible like that? Luke 6, I always look at this in people's Bible. And it's interesting to me. Look at uh, verse uh, uh, 35. Once again, love your enemies, do good, lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and evil men. And then it says, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not what? Judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be what? Condemned, pardoned, and you will not, and you will be, what does it say? Give, and it will be. What's interesting is if you look at 90% of the Bibles out there, do you know which parts of this verse people underline? And you will not be judged. And you will not be condemned. And you will be pardoned. And it will be given to you. But I want you to look at what people don't underline this morning. Look at those other words. Do not what? Don't judge. And look at the other one. It says, do not what? Don't condemn. Don't judge. Don't condemn. Give. Pardon. Why? Why? Because then you'll be like your father in heaven. Because he doesn't judge. When he finds women caught in adultery, he says, I don't condemn you either. And he pardons. Not because you've asked. But because he is a forgiving God. That's what he is. And then that last one, give. I realized that moment, I fell to my knees that morning and I realized that no matter what I did, it wasn't going to change what God was toward me. That God was good to me, not because I was good, but because he was good. Amen. That God was going to be nice to me, not because I was nice, but because he was nice. Amen. That God was going to love me. Not because I'm lovable, but because God is love. And you can't explain it. Love is just what love does. You can't give a reason for it. But the single greatest encounter I've had with what God is like. Take your hand out with me this morning. John 14, 10. Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, they're not just my own. Rather, it's the Father living where? Doing whose work? Ponder that. What does that verse mean? 
Where was the father? All along Jesus' life, talk to me. I've got 40 minutes, and if you take up my time being quiet, I'm going to be so upset at you. (laughs) Where was the father every moment of Jesus' life? In his son. Someone once said to me, if God loves us so much, why did he send his son? Why didn't he come himself? In him was the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. He did. He came in the person of his son. And the reason the blood of the lamb is so precious is because it was not some blood being offered to an angry God who needed appeased. It was the blood of God himself given in his son. You wrap your mind around that and tell me about the cross. It was the blood of the Father himself being given for you and me in the person of Jesus. Some of you might have a hard time wrapping your head around that thought. I didn't make it up. Jesus in John 14, 9 said, Have I been so long with you and yet you've come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen who? Is that true even on the cross? And some say, wait a second. The father wasn't in Jesus on the cross. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, did he? Did he cry out that? Did he say those words? Yeah, and did he feel like God had forsaken him? Anybody here ever sinned? Just once even. Anybody? When you have, well, I thought I had one. No, I'm just kidding. When you sin, what does that do to you intrinsically, psychologically, and emotionally? How does that make you feel? Anyone ever felt so much guilt, so much shame, so much condemnation, you were so tempted to feel like God was condemning you for what you've done that you actually felt like God was a universe away from you? Anyone ever been there before? I ask you, in that moment, although you may feel like God is far away, where is he? He's right there. He's right there. I would suggest to you that it's when you feel like he's the furthest away that he's the closest because that's when you need him the most. Now, now, what is it that's, if he's not far away, what is it that's making you feel like he's far away? Yeah, it's sin. And when Jesus took your sin upon himself, and don't ask me how that works. I used to know. <laughs> but when Jesus took your sin upon himself, do you think it affected him psychologically any differently? Do you think he felt shame and guilt and condemnation? Do you think he felt those? Do you think he did? Do you think it made him feel like God was far away when God was right there? I'll give you proof. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Where was God at the cross? God was, where does it say, brothers and sisters? In Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. This wasn't Jesus appeasing some bloodthirsty God as a whipping boy. This was God himself in that being. Are you hearing me? It's a much different picture, isn't it? I ask you this. Did Jesus pay God for our sins? (laughs) What have you just done to what I've just said? Or were your sins forgiven? Either the debt was repaid or the debt was forgiven. Can't be both. Are you hearing me? You say, well, Herb, doesn't the Bible use the language of payment? Yes. Have you ever forgiven anybody of anything? Anyone here ever forgiven someone? Did it cost you something to forgive them? Yeah, but it wasn't some third party paying it. It was you, the one doing the forgiving, wasn't it? Process that. That's a different sermon. Man, it's so hard to stay focused. (laughs) And what is God like? There are 50 sermons competing right now in my head. And I tried to get a handout to sum it up, but it doesn't work. Let me share this. This This is what finally did it for me. 
What I shared with you about seeing that he gave, he didn't condemn, he judged. He loved me though I was enemy. He was gonna continue to give to me and bless me no matter how I did. It was at that moment that the journey began for me that I fell to my knees in tears. And I said, you know, God, if you're gonna love me no matter what I do, if you're gonna be good to me no matter what I do, if you're gonna give me life no matter what I do, my heart would only allow me to do one thing in that moment. And it so resonates with me. I did not choose to serve God at age 16 because how he would treat me if I was good. I chose to serve him in that moment because of how I began to believe he would treat me if I was his enemy. And I said, man, God, if you really like that, if I would choose to be your enemy and you would still bless me and love me and take care of me because of what's in your heart, not in mine, my heart would only permit me that morning to make one decision. God, take this life back. I don't care where it takes me. I don't care how many countless hours I spend on the road in strange hotels. God, I just want to help other people see what you're like to your enemies. Amen. That's where it began. But a few years ago, I stumbled upon Psalms 88. Go to the back of your handout. You can be thankful we skipped the inside. We're out of time. Psalms 88, I believe, is a messianic psalm, which simply, if that's a strange phrase for you, that simply means it not only speaks of David's experience, but it also prophesies of what the Messiah would go through. Jesus said, I am reckoned among those who go down to the pit. I've become like a man without strength, forsaken among the dead. Was Jesus numbered with the transgressors? Whatever that means. Did he feel forsaken among the dead by God? Like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember. What does that say? What are those two words? Take your pen out and circle those. Whom you remember. What does that say? See, that's very different than what he said to the thief on the cross. First of all, how many hours was Jesus on the cross? How many commandments are there? How come we know so much about the commandments, but we know so little about the cross? That's another sermon too. I would suggest to you that we have specialized in the wrong subject. It's so hard to stay focused. <laughs> Jesus was on the cross for six hours. The first three are recorded for us in detail in the scriptures. The last three, the scriptures are strangely silent. Now, I have a hypothesis. I think the reason that is, is because the first three hours, Jesus' suffering was primarily physical. They could record what they were doing to his body. They're spitting on him. They're pulling his beard. They're dividing up his garments. This is what he's saying. It was primarily external and imposed by people. Are you with me? But when we transit to the last three hours, his, his suffering did a transition as well. It went from being primarily physical to being now primarily psychological and emotional. And could the disciples sit there and say, well, this is what he's feeling right now. So therefore, there's just what? Silence. There's nothing, there's no description until we get to the very end of that six hour period. It was the ninth hour of the day. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, where are you? All my life I have done what you asked. I have been in your perfect will. I have felt your presence. Why have you forsaken me, God? Where did you go? Why am I alone? I don't know what happened. And I don't think we'll ever fully comprehend it, do you? Between those first three hours and the last three hours, because in the first three, he looks over at the thief on the cross and he says, dude, sorry. Oops. Man, <laughs> sick sense of humor. He said, remember me when I'm in your kingdom. And Jesus looked back at him and said, I'm not going to have to remember you. We're going to be there together. 
Now, when he said that, where did Jesus, for him to be able to say that in his own mind, where did Jesus think he was going to end up when he was said and done? In heaven. Was this, you'll remember me no more? Talk to me. Was this Psalms 88 at this point? No. At this point, Calvary is just a bad weekend trip. Are you with me? On Sunday morning, man, me and this dude next to me, we're going to be in paradise. Got it? And I hate to belittle it, but it was primarily physical in the beginning. But notice what happens once it transits. And this is why I'm a Christian. This is why I continue to follow God. Yes, it began with seeing what he's like in relation to his enemies. But it became much more personal and much more dynamic for me. During those last three hours, something changed. He's not saying, I'll be with you in paradise. He's saying, I'm going to go into the grave and I'm going to be remembered. What does it say? No more. That means at that point, was he going to be resurrected? Yes. But did he feel like he was going to be resurrected? Was the father still with him? But did he feel like the father was with him? He felt abandoned by God, stricken, smitten of God, and we thought so too, haven't we? Isn't that what it says in Isaiah 53? But what's the next word? But. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, but. What does but mean? One T. Be careful. <laughs> to the contrary. We haven't seen the cross exactly as it truly was. We saw him smitten, stricken of God, but he was God. There's God. Not the one punishing, the one suffering. Do you see the difference? In this moment, I believe with all my heart that my Savior lost the hope of seeing himself come through the portals of the tomb, a conqueror. It was at this point that I believe my God found himself fixed between two decisions. Either he was going to save me, the thief next to him, or he was going to save him both, save himself. But they both weren't going to be there together in paradise. Do you see what his decision became? Either he's going to save us or he's going to save himself. But he can't do both. It's no longer you'll be with me in paradise. I did a set of meetings for a group of five-year-olds recently. I have spent 10 years talking to adults. And I really like teenagers, but five-year-olds, man, you got to stand on your head, breathe fire, and juggle with your feet <laughs> to talk to five-year-olds. But they were having this Thanksgiving meal, and, and, and one kid got this special prize. And I said, you know, you, this one, you, one of you gets to draw a ticket. They're going to draw a name, and you're going to, you know, one person. And what would happen, what would happen if, if one of your friends, you, one of your, you were allowed to pick one friend to enjoy this special thing with you? How much would you have to like that friend? And they said, well, that'd have to be a pretty good friend. And I said, but what if the condition was... They drew your name and you couldn't do it with someone, but you could actually give it to someone to let them do it instead of you. How good of a friend would they have to be then? You could see the lights in the five-year-old's heads turning on. They're like, oh, no, 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 I don't have a friend like that. <laughs> no, I think I'd just take it myself. I, I, I like five-year-olds now because they're transparent. We like to cover that stuff up. They're like, no, I'll have the cookie, thanks. But process this. Is there a difference between Jesus dying to be with us in heaven or Jesus dying thinking he's not going to make it, but we're going to make it in his place? Is there a difference between those two? There's a vast difference. And this is what this is the reason I'm a Christian today. I believe in those last three hours, and I'm going to wrap up here. 
I believe in those last three hours, Satan presented. I believe the devil was present there. If you believe in the devil, I believe he was present at the Calvary, amen? amen. And I believe he presented three things. All the adoration of the angels, write these down. The reuniting embrace with his father. and all the glories of heaven. What are the three? Adoration of the reuniting embrace with his and all the glories of. Are you with me? Did you write them down? If they're important, you'll see. And if he presented these three things to Jesus in the first three hours, Jesus would have said, yes, I can save Herb and have those three things too. But he waited and presented them in the last three hours. So now what's Jesus thinking? All the glories of heaven, all the adoration of the angels, that reuniting embrace with his father or save me, but he's not going to have both. Do you catch that? And at that moment, Satan began to whisper to him, you don't understand, Jesus. Sin is so hateful to a holy God that this is going to separate you from him forever. And I hate to go on another tangent, but don't we do the same thing? Don't we do the same thing? I mean, don't misunderstand me. God hates sin, amen? But sometimes, he thinks he's, sometimes we think his feelings towards us are the same thing that he feels towards our sin, don't we? We think, yes, God hates sin. He must hate me too because I sin. Are there people out there that have that perception? What had, this, what had Satan left out when saying this is going to separate, he hates sin so much, this is going to separate you from him forever. What part had Satan left out? That although God hates sin, yes, with a hatred as strong as death, the God of this universe loves the sinner with a love that is stronger than death. He feels totally different about you than he does about what you've done. He doesn't care what you've done. He doesn't care where you've been. He just cares where you're going, amen? That's God. But he began to whisper these things, and, and you think you've wrestled with your sin before. Imagine what it was like for the psyche of God himself in human form to wrestle with this, every sin, every murder, every rape, every child molestation that has ever taken place, and feeling responsible for that from the beginning of time to the end. Do you think that was a struggle for him? What would it be like for you if you were just conscious of that stuff? Forget feeling responsible. If you just knew about it, would that be torment? And he's feeling all of this psychological garbage that we've produced. It's our fault. And Satan's now saying, the glories of heaven, the adoration of the angels, the reuniting embrace with his father, this is going to separate you from him forever. You're going to go into the grave and be remembered. When did it say? No more. There is no, if you do this, this is goodbye to life forever, Jesus. Save yourself. Save your, you will either save Herb Montgomery and an eternal loss to yourself or you will save yourself and an eternal loss to Herb but you will not be able to do both. Save yourself. And you know what's the most painful for me in that whole understanding and that whole picture that I have in my head of how it went down that day? Satan plagues me with this. That he took all the adoration of the angels and in Jesus' heart, he compared him to how many times Herb Montgomery would fail to give him the adoration he deserves. And Satan pressed that upon the heart of my God and said, are you really going to trade that for that? And in that moment, as my fate was hanging in the balance, and I, once again, I don't understand all the details of Calvary and the whys, I'll freely admit, I got more questions about the cross than I got answers these days. But the one thing I do know is the heart of the being that was on that cross. I don't understand all the ins and outs of why he was there and what he was doing. But this is why I'm a Christian today. <laughs> because my God 
in those closing moments, he told Peter he could have called on 12 legions. Isn't that true? My God looked into all the glories of heaven and said, heaven is not a place that I desire to be if that young man cannot be there with me. And if I am going to save myself at his eternal ruin or save him at my own eternal loss, I love that boy and I will save him at any cost to myself, even if it's eternity. He looked back at his father and he said, you know, I'd rather Herb have that reuniting embrace with you. And he bowed his head and for me, he died. And I look at that kind of self-abandonment. I look at that kind of selflessness. You don't understand, I have been loved by many people on this planet. I was an only child. I know what it means like to be loved. But I've never been loved like that. I have been affected by time with many people, but I've never been influenced and affected like I have by my time with him. I look at God and I feel my strongest emotion when I look at the cross is, you know, God, you don't understand. I am never going to be worth that. Don't you, don't you get it? I am never going to be worth you giving up all that for me. I haven't even been there. I don't know what it's like. I don't even know what you gave up. But I am not worthy. God, please give up heaven for someone else. But God, don't do that for me. I'm just not worth it. And you know what I hear him whispering to me every time? This is why I follow him. He says, Herb, I didn't do it because you were worth it. I did it because I love you and you can't change that. And I say, you know, if that's really what God is like. I have friends from all walks of life. Anyone ever heard of Facebook? <laughs> Facebook has gotten me in a whole heap of trouble. Because <laughs> I'm a preacher. But not all my friends who make posts on my Facebook page are preachers. Do you guys get that? Do you know what that means? And I actually believe that God loves everybody. Anyone else of the same opinion? Which causes my social spheres to be a little diverse at times. Got it? A lot of people out there that are my friend that aren't like me. Do you get how that works? And they'll say things that get me in trouble as if they're me, but it's okay. They're worth it. <laughs> But I've got friends that say to me, Herb, what if there is no heaven? What if there is no hell? What if there is no reward? What if there is no punishment? What if there's nothing in this for you? And this is where it really comes down to. What if there's really nothing in it for you, Herb? What if all the countless hours away from your family on the road every weekend are for naught? You know what I say to them? I learned this from my 11-year-old daughter. It's a great phrase. You just look them straight in the eye and you say, with all due respect, I don't give a rip. <laughs> Do you know why? Do you know why, though? Because my God gave to me. Luke 6, hoping for nothing in return. Do you catch it? He gave to me when he thought there was no heaven in it for him. And even if there is no heaven, even if there is no hell, even if this life is all I've got, this one thing I know, the God that I've encountered is so different from even what Christians have told me. He is so selfless. He is so other-centered. He is so self-abandoning. Flat out, he is the most beautiful being 
I have ever encountered in my existence. And even if there's nothing in it for me, even if there is no reward or punishment, he has won my heart by his love for me to such a degree that even if there is nothing, if I get nothing back, he is just worthy of somebody loving him back the way he loves us. You say, well, Herb, that's not possible with all due respect. I don't care if it's possible or not. Doesn't he deserve somebody trying? Doesn't he? Will someone step up to the front and say, you know, I want to love, I want to learn to love him the way he loves me. How many would like to make that decision today? You know, before you can do that, you have to see it, don't you? You have to see how much he really loves you. And so that's really what it's about. It's not about doing anything. It's not about loving him back. It's about giving him permission to show you in your life, no matter what it takes, how much he loves you. See, Christians, and I love them, and I am one, kinda. Depends on how you define it. But Christians make this big deal, you know. Have you got Jesus in your heart? Do you have God? Have you accepted God into your heart? Anyone ever heard that phrase before? Man, it is so not, it is so not about that. It's not about you having God in your heart. It's about seeing that you are in his. Do you catch the difference? If you can see how much you're in his heart, he'll be in yours. Just like your family and your mother and your wife and your kids are in your heart, you'll gravitate towards that. If you can just see what he's really like. Let's pray. Let's stand up for a moment. Dear God, I felt your presence here today with all of us. And Lord, I don't know who's in this room. I don't know where they're at. I don't know what their picture is of you. All I can speak of this morning is what you've shown me. Father, my prayer is that in this room, there would simply be an open-mindedness for you to reach into our heart and uproot all of the misconceptions that are present about you and your character and your love. That we would be willing. Father, please, you show us what you're really like. Not just this weekend. May this weekend just be the beginning of an incredible journey of discovery. For each of us, Lord. In your precious name we pray. Amen.